subgroups at the conference. Um, we wanted to start right off the bat talking about some of the big issues uh, and thinking about a national response, uh, national policy. And so immigration is right there at the front. Um, you know, there are, there are many ways that police and law enforcement and the criminal justice system uh, are used against people labeled as gang members. And one of the ways that that happens that's not always recognized is through deportation. That removal proceedings are one of the government's gang suppression strategies. So this panel will be able to deal directly with that, both in terms of uh, how it looks in the community, why it's an important issue, also how it's been playing out in courtrooms and immigration courts over the last several years. Uh, and finally, what we can look forward to uh, for the next several years. So we're going to have uh, three presentations. The first is going to be from uh, two community activists, uh, Alex Goodwin and Sanat Sobravia from Organized, community, uh, Organized Communities Against Deportation. Alex is from BYP 100. That will be followed by Professor Leila Halas, who was one of the um, authors of a survey of gang allegations in immigration court, a survey of um, immigration lawyers that was um, the, the best really statistical uh, quantitative look at what, what was going on at least a couple of years ago. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna hear from Julie Mao from the Just Futures Law who's really, I think, gonna tell us about what we're looking forward to and what's emerging in this field. So let me give you a quick introduction to uh, Shanat. Uh, she leads OCADs, that's the Organized Communities Against Deportation in Chicago. She leads their deportation defense work by connecting people threatened with deportation to OCA, OCAD's network of attorneys. She's an expert, sorry, she's an, uh, She's an expert in connecting legal defense and organizing. And for those of you who don't know her organization, it's an intergenerational collective who comes together to fight against deportations and criminalization in Chicago. They describe, the, describe themselves as undocumented, unapologetic, and unafraid. Their work includes supporting the defense of people in removal proceedings and advocating for policy changes, such as expanding Chicago sanctuary laws and ending the use of Chicago PD's gang database, which for years was used as a basis for denying sanctuary to immigrants. And Alex is currently a deputy campaign director at the Action Center on Race and the Economy. She organizes with BYP 100 Chicago and is a co-founder and writer with Left Out Magazine. Her writing and activism are centered around the momentum and challenges of building black power and self-determination. Her work at ACRE, ACRE, currently focuses on the relationship between the finance industry and policing, racialized capitalism, and how these things exacerbate oppressions. So I'm gonna turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Cool, thanks y'all. I'm gonna take a second to do a screen share, our favorite um, tech tool. Okay. Okay. Um, and can folks see this, what's on the screen? Okay, cool. So yeah, this is just our title slide. Um, as Sean shared, my name is Alex. I use she and her pronouns, and I'm a member of BYP 100. Um, and I'll be facilitating today with Shanat. Cool. Okay. So um, Sean shared a little bit about our organizations. I'll talk about BYP 100. And Shanat, if you want to add anything about OCAD, you should. Um, but BYP 100 is a national, um, all black, black led direct action organization. Um, we have chapters around the country and one in Chicago in particular. Um, and uh, yeah, our work in Chicago looks like being a part of the defund CPD campaign, being a part of the campaign to get rid of the gang database um, and participating in mutual aid projects. Yes, and I'm, I'm Shanad. I also use she, her pronouns and I'm part of OCAD, um, non-documented group, like Sean was saying, we started in 2013 coming out of uh, Immigrant Youth Justice League, so undocumented young people getting to know each other and trying to navigate being undocumented and then figuring out the deportation uh, and trying to intervene in that situation I felt needed and right for us, and so we created OCAD. Okay. 
And that's how we've also been uh, learning how the criminal justice system and um, all of that kind of intertwines uh, and impacts each other. Cool, so just a, a couple of disclaimers um, before we get into the rest of the presentation. Uh, we know that we still have a lot to learn about the gang database in Chicago um, and gang databases in Illinois, gang databases around the country. Um, we are not necessarily the experts. Um, we are just going to be sharing our experiences and things that we've learned from our experiences. Um, we also recognize that together we know a lot. And so I would encourage y'all to be interactive in the chat, um, share your own experiences and the questions that you have um, while during our like next 20 minutes. Um, and then also important to name that um, myself and Shana and our organizations are a part of a larger coalition of grassroots groups, um, legals, uh, legal services under the same goal um, to expose the gang database and end the biased practice of gang designation. Um, cool. And the goals uh, over the next 20 minutes, um, we want to present a timeline of our campaign in Chicago to erase the gang database. Um, and we want to use this timeline as a way to talk about strategy, um, talk about our challenges and our wins, and then also present a summary of how CPD uses the gang database. Uh, so, uh, getting us into the beginning of the presentation and how we even came to the gang database as like a target for demands. Um, this came out of uh, Chicago's fight for and against the, the city's welcoming city ordinance. Um, organizers found at the time that the welcoming city ordinance was, which was supposed to be um, to establish Chicago as a sanctuary city. Um, had carve outs that included that if you were in the gang database, you were essentially not um, covered under the sanctuary carve outs of the welcoming cities ordinance. And so um, with that, our demands became that we protect all Chicagoans from, from immigration enforcement by eliminating the carve outs, um, eliminating CPD's gang database, create policies that decriminalize and reduce arrests, and decrease police funding and invest in black and brown communities. Um, and I think it's really important that number four, um, because uh, we've gone back and forth in the campaign about reparations and um, have come to agreement that like it's it's a really like it's an important word for us to use, an important thing for us to fight for um, as we get rid of the gang database. Um, and so again, we want it, we're using this campaign to identify the gang database as a racist tool that criminalized black and brown communities um, and also creates a pipeline to both incarceration and deportation. Um, and we recognize that the gang database is one way to attack the system of racialized surveillance, criminalization, incarceration, and deportations. Um, and these, because these things disproportionately impact um, black and brown communities. And I'll pass it over to Shanat. Yeah, so we want to talk a little bit about what we know so far. Um, and it's been through FOIAs, it's been through lawsuits, and it's been through ex lived experiences of people in the community that we have gathered the information that we can share today. We know the Chicago Gang Database that dates back to the 1980s. Um, right now, it comprises over 161,000 people in it. Um, 128,000 approximately are adults and 33,000 uh, are young people. Uh, we know that 95% of the people listed are Black and Latinx, being 70% being Black, 25% Latinx, and 5% or a little less uh, white. We also know that this means that 11% of Chicago's Black population is in the gang database, 4% of the Latinx population is in the gang database, and 0.6% of the white population is in the gang database. And just to put it into context, because we know that gang databases exist in other states and other cities. I mean, there's even a country, national and you know, international databases. We know that uh, California, as of 2018, had 100,000 people, while New York had 17,500. And just to put it into context, Chicago has over 161,000, increasing every day. And then how does it impact us? I mean, um, oh, sorry, Alex. 
Um, sorry, y'all. So uh, these are uh, some of the ways we understand people to end up in the gang database. Um, I think this first point around officers having unlimited discretion is really, really important um, because it allows, it essentially is giving CPD the authority um, to label anybody a gang member based off of their own expertise um, or knowledge. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's really important to name. I think that it also speaks to um, the numbers that Shanat just shared around who is in the gang database, um, because we know that our communities on the, um, like black and, and brown communities in particular are over-policed. Um, and so, um, of course, there's going to be more black and brown people in the gang database. There are more police in their neighborhood. Um, picking folks up with uh, some of these things that are listed here, like tattoos, um, clothing, use of signal signals or symbols, um, information provided from a, third party or another CPD officer. Um, CPD is also using social media. And then um, there is a bullet point around uh, people who have like self-admitted to being gang members. But I think um, there is a lack of credibility there as well, um, understanding the way police operate. Um, yeah, and get folks to admit to harm. And so also with that, uh, we know that police don't need any evidence to support gang designation. Um, this is the, the self-admitted piece. 88% of uh, people have supposedly self-admitted to gang membership, but there's no documentation or criteria. Um, and 11% of the people in the gang database have no reason listed for their inclusion. Um, okay, I think, is this one also me, Shanat? Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, we understand that the gang database is fueled by CLEAR, um, which is citizen law enforcement reporting and analysis. Um, and this is where CPD is inputting the information that they collect from gang arrest cards and investigatory stop reports. Um, and you'll see the numbers here, just like looking at the number of investigatory stop reports, 145,000 people um, have been hit with these, uh, with these reports and cards, which, yeah, it's just, is a massive uh, amount of people, um, that police are stopping and then including in the gay database. Yeah, and so usually don't know where, when, and if you're in the database, usually you're, finding out by how you're being treated, impacted. Um, and so here are some ways that we've seen people being impacted by being in the gang database. Oftentimes learning that they're in the database afterwards. Um, we know that immigration, it impacts immigration. So as OCAD, we've seen a lot of folks go into court and then the government, you know, arguing with the judge saying that the person is in the gang database, is a gang affiliated, and therefore should not be granted bond or uh, relief. We know it has impacted people's access to employment. Um, we also know that people find out when bail is being uh, denied or bond. Um, it impacts parole and the way you're able to come to your, to your community. Oftentimes we find um, limitations as to you cannot be associated with so-and-so. And that means oftentimes family in your neighborhood. Um, it impacts parental rights increases police harassment. So we know people being pulled over for a traffic violation instead of one cop car, it's two, and it becomes really aggressive. Um, unreasonable search and seizures, it impacts licenses, um, work, and also, you know, uh, for different kinds of careers. Education, we've seen that impact also people's access to education. Um, and then, yes, false arrest, false imprisonments. And so there's a lot of impacts beyond, you know, just being in it. Um, and so we're gonna put, uh, is it one slide? Yes. Um, and so us is at NUCAD and here in Chicago, we started exploring this and seeing this. I mean, we had the case of one of our members we met um, whose home was raided in 2017. Um, it was very violent. Uh, seven ICE officers came and detained him. We learned that he that ICE justified their presence by saying that he was in the gang database. Um, Umed had no clue. 
Uh, but then we found out, you know, as Alex mentioned, uh, it was two police interactions, two separate times where he was placed on it. And this was after Hoyas and litigation. We had actually was the first one in Chicago to sue the city of Chicago for being placed in the gang database and having all these consequences. Um, and so that's how we started learning a little bit of what clear and um, how difficult it is to know and how impossible it is to get out of it too. Um, so another part of our organizing or a piece that's been really important to our organizing is research. Um, we have folks in, within the campaign coalition um, who took on a lot of this research to better understand how the gang database works and how CPD is using it. And so that's the UIC Policing in Chicago Research Group um, who um, produced uh, these two re these reports here tracked and targeted um, expansive and focused surveillance and then also um, some research on the county's database and I, I think that also like this research was really important because um, it wasn't done by the city right it was done by organizers and people who um, understand and believe in this issue and I and I think also was part of what inspired or pushed our um, the Office of Inspector General, which is Chicago's like independent auditor to do their own research and investigation into, um, into the police department and their use of the gang database. Um, and yes, we are like also directly organizing our folks. So there have been, you know, we're using tactics such as like teach-ins and political education um, online and in, well, in person and now online um, to, to tell people more about the gang database um, and move people towards, uh, yeah, contacting their older person um, and saying that, you know, that this thing doesn't work and we don't want CPD using it anymore. Uh, and then, oh, sorry. Yeah, and also we sued the city ourselves. Uh, several organizations filed a class action lawsuit um, along with four or five individuals, four individuals um, as well. And um, yeah, it was BYP 100, OCAD, Mi Gente, BPNC, Blocks Together. We all went in and I think it was a, a one year long lawsuit. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can, we, in the lawsuit, we were able to argue, um, is it not in the law? Let's say. We were able to argue uh, due process protections, um, no notice of gang designation to people and the sharing of the information, incorrect information many times uh, to third parties. We came later to know that it's 500 uh, th third parties that actually gather and use the gang database um, information. So those were the grounds. We knew that the lawsuit wasn't gonna be the place where we get rid of it. We knew it was a, a place to get information exposed. Um, and yeah, so one of the things that we did settle, we didn't settle as organizations, but the individuals did settle um, back in last year. And they did get um, compensation for the harm that they, they received. And so that has informed also our thinking through the ordinance and what we are going to then be fighting for here in Chicago through um, policy. Sorry for the slide mix up there, y'all. It's also coordinating little people in the background. Um, and uh, yeah, so also it's important here that we're holding our elected officials accountable um, to fight for this. And so um, in 2019, uh, we were able to halt the use of the Cook County gang database, which is really exciting um, and shows again that getting rid of gang databases are possible. Um, as I mentioned before, also in 2019, the Inspector General released a report confirming, confirming that CPD's gang database is filled with errors. Um, and right now, um, our strategy has moved into pushing city council members to support the community restoration ordinance, um, which we're going to talk about in a second. But I think like I, Chicago is a special case because we have 50 city council members. 
um, which is just like a daunting number. Um, and we've been meeting with folks now for, I would say a couple years on this issue. Um, and I think that like our campaign is in a place where, yeah, where we're actually gonna win and pass this ordinance. Gotta speak it into existence. And so um, the community restoration ordinance, uh, this is a look at some of the language that's in the ordinance, but um, an overview essentially is that it will uh, get rid of the gang database and also establish these peace commissions, um, which are a form of community led um, violence interruption and prevention. So there are young people in Chicago um, in an organization called Good Kids Mad City and um, shout out to Miracle if she's still on here. Um, but Good Kids Mad City has been pushing um, for the city to institute or um, establish the peace book. And as part of the peace book, there would be these peacekeepers and commissions in each ward um, who would be able to conduct peace negotiation and violence interruption. And we think that that's like a very, that was a very important piece. Um, and one of the reasons that we felt like there should be a combination of our fights between getting rid of the gang database and instituting the peace book um, because the gang database, again, is an example of the way the state criminalizes us simply for being black and brown um, and living where we live and keeping the people around us that we keep. I think another important thing here is that being a gang member is, is not illegal um, and that oftentimes people move into gangs for um, to, to have their needs provided for because the state is not doing that for us. And so um, this ordinance here is a way that's going to like provide reparations and make structural change ar um, around the way the state um, has been criminalizing folks. Um, so I don't mind reading the stuff that's on the slide, but the CRO would disrupt the cycle of criminalization um, by dissolving the database um, and prohibiting CPD from creating any new gang database. Um, it won't be able to share, CPD won't be able to share data with other agencies and would provide compensation um, modeled off of uh, what we want in the lawsuit for individual plaintiffs. Um, and then also um, the CRO again would establish uh, the peace book and the peace commissions, um, which I just spoke about. And so um, with that, I think it's, uh, we felt like it was also important to share what some of our challenges and wins have been. Um, some of our big challenges have been um, combating the narrative around gang and gun violence um, that allows for the criminalization of black and brown people. So I was literally on a panel right before this where folks were like, I don't like defund. And I was like, oh, <laughs> this is <laughs> gonna be a tough one. Um, and people are like, you know, I think hesitant around these kind of alternatives and proposals like getting rid of gang databases um, because they experience very real violence in their neighborhoods. And it's important for us not to invalidate that and also name that um, the gang database is a form of surveillance. It is not prevention, it is not interruption, it's not solving or halting crime before it happens. Um, and so another challenge, uh, sustaining capacity throughout our campaign. Uh, this has been a long-term fight that started in like 2017. It is now 2021 and we are still fighting for this thing. And I think, yeah, uh, capacity and movement spaces, as you all probably understand, is just like a, an ebbing and flowing thing. Um, another challenge has been reform. Um, the lawsuit was an example of a place where we um, had to make a hard decision about like, do we settle with the city um, that would like provide some relief to some people, but essentially like create reforms for what we're up against. And, and we chose against that because it was really important for us to maintain our stance that like the gang database needs to be abolished. Um, and I think the other piece here too, is that while we've done research, the OIG has done research, like all of these things have come out about the way the gang database does not work, rather than getting rid of it, CPD and the city are looking for ways to reform it and make tweaks and make changes and institute a new one rather than get rid of this thing. And then um, 
Lastly, uh, making sure we don't create a better way to surveil us. Um, the carve outs piece, like making sure that the ordinance is inclusive, making sure that our demands and the things that we're fighting for are inclusive so that we don't create um, more holes um, and harm for our communities in the long run. And I'll pass it back to Shanat. Yeah, I want to leave it with some wins. Um, I mean, there's some things to celebrate. Uh, we made enough noise for the OIG to conduct an investigation. It took a year long. They had a difficult time getting, gathering data from C the CPP. Um, but it confirmed everything we had been saying up to that point. Um, we created a, we have been creating an opportunity for visibility in other towns and cities. Uh, while we were engaged in the Chicago Gang database, the Cook County Gang database, we were able to delete um, and argue that, you know, it's problematic um, and shouldn't exist. At least we had one less database in Illinois so far. And then individual plaintiffs got compensation from the city acknowledging the mistake. And I think that's also like we've been saying, um, it has helped also inform and, and create some momentum for our ordinance. And yeah, just um, why we think the database in Chicago is harmful, no due process, compensation of specific groups of people, information is shared with hundreds of agencies. My new, including the, uh, the Chicago Public School was also one of the top ones that accessed it. And it is used to justify more policing, police interactions and bigger budgets for themselves. Um, so that's the closeout of our presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and I think we're on to the next presenter if we're not taking Q&A right now. That's right. Well, what we're gonna try and do is save the Q&A for after the third presentation. So we have a good sense of how much time we have and, and don't end up cutting off Julie since she's going third. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I really wanted to make sure that we grounded this in grassroots work. Uh, and you've done exactly that, that we think about, you know, that, that gang suppression is often a proxy for racialized policing. Uh, and that is, I think, the way that it is spread through the nation and into immigration proceedings, uh, right? Immigration proceedings are a form of, of racism. Um, and so they find common cause with, with gang suppression. Um, and what began in some ways in a few urban centers has now spread nationally so that, you know, Georgia uh, talks the most about, you know, gangs, uh, even though, um, you know, from what I know about crime in, in Georgia, it does not look like crime in South LA. Uh, so that was great. Thank you very much. Um, now we're going to move on to the next presentation, which will be from Professor Klass, uh, where we will get into a little bit more of at, at the national level, what has this focus on, um, or what is what is uh, removal proceedings use of gang allegations actually looked like? Um, so Professor Glass is a law professor at Tulane Law School in New Orleans, where she co-directs the Immigrant Rights Clinic. Her teaching and scholarship focus on the rights of immigrant children and detained immigrants. And among her many publications, Professor Class is co-author of Deportation by Any Means Necessary, a national survey regarding gang allegations and immigration proceedings, which was published by the Immigrant Legal Resource Center in 2018. And I'll pass the mic to you. Thank you. Great. Uh, thanks so much for having me. It's, um, I feel honored to be in this group and be talking about the, this, these important issues. I'm going to also take a minute to try to share my screen. Um, let's see. There we go. Okay, great. Um, so I'm Layla Halas. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. Um, as uh, Sean was saying, I, I teach and I uh, direct the Immigrant Rights Clinic at Tulane in New Orleans. Uh, although I've um, been practicing immigration law and teaching in, a, in several different cities um, for the past decade or so. Um, and I'm kind of specifically focus on thinking about young people in the immigration legal system and um, have worked um, a lot with young people um, and, and thinking about the ways the immigration legal system has kind of historically and continues to be a project in kind of building racial hierarchies and um, 
uh, kind of racist uh, immigrant uh, immigrant policing and what the implications are for that. And so some of the law review articles I've written are recently are um, the school to deportation pipeline, thinking about how some of our laws really kind of push young people out of schools and into removal proceedings um, and, and also the adultification of immigrant children. And I'm gonna to talk today about a report that um, Rachel Prandini of ILRC and I did several years ago. So I'm gonna spend kind of most of my time talking about that, but I think you'll kind of hear a lot of overlap um, from what Shanad and Alex were talking about in a lot of different ways um, and, and kind of tracking like how the database is, is working, the communication and collaboration between these different agencies and then what the implications are on people's lives. Uh, and then I'll spend a couple of minutes just talking about like what I think the implications are now since it, it is a few years since we um, did this survey and report. So I'll start out by saying the Immigration Nationality Act does not define gangs, even though it gets kind of thrown around in immigration court and immigration proceedings. There's not kind of this universal definition. DHS does kind of have some guidance um, that requires the association of three or more individuals. Um, but there's no specific uh, meaning when it gets kind of put into these, you know, immigration police reports, the I-213 or um, other kinds of Im immigration notes. Um, and in fact, as you know, you may know, localities have all sorts of different definitions and have like long lists of, of factors that might implicate, you know, whether they're going to say someone's gang affiliated, including like the clothes people wear, including like whose people family members are including what neighborhoods people live in. Um, so those are, you know, and, and, and also like, you know, gang signs. And in and, and my case, you know, my client like had made a peace sign like on his social media and that was um, somehow um, interpreted as a gang sign. So um, very broad definition. Um, and then what we were seeing is a single school police officer, a single Im immigration agent, a single um, you know police officer on the street, you know, writes something up, um, and that kind of you know gut reaction that someone has, um, again, often informed by kind of um, you know racialized understandings of people's identities, that then gets written down and then can uh, find its way um, into a database. It can be fed into the immigration legal system. Uh, and then has often devastating consequences for people. It can mean that um, people are, um, as you heard earlier, that their homes are kind of like violently raided, um, that they are then taken into custody, that they are denied bond um, in the immigration context and have to remain in immigrant detention, um, that they are denied an immigration benefit based on discretion, and then that they're ordered deported. Um, so, so often that's what we were seeing, like what the implications were when uh, gang affiliation um, allegations were kind of seeping into the system. And we also noted that, and people said this, the word gang affiliation and gang member were just like interchangeably being used. And so again, just um, really broad um, kind of uh, using in a very kind of broad manner by law enforcement. So I'm going to start talking about the um, kind of uh, one young person's story um, that was shared in our report. Um, and and it, it really describes kind of like how this might happen and the, the ways that allegations are made um, and the kind of confluence and interconnectedness of the kind of surveillance and law enforcement systems. Um, so, so this is a young person who was in high school um, and unbeknownst to him, someone he went to school with told the school police officer that they had heard from yet another person in high school that he was in a gang. So that got written up unbeknownst to him. He wasn't informed about it. He wasn't you know, disciplined about it. Um, and then the school officer noted um, on a different day that he saw him standing near someone who he, the school officer believed was a gang member. So based on those kind of 
two things, the school police officer wrote up a report and sent it to um, a regional fusion center. So these are these like database centers created post 9-11 to collect information about threats to national security. So he begins, he's entered into this gang database. Uh, and then that information is shared with ICE. And so after that happens, his home is also uh, ransacked. He is taken into custody. He is put into detention. Um, in fact, he, you know, his, his papers with his immigration lawyers, phone numbers were taken away. And so he didn't um, reach out um, for weeks and until we kind of did some digging to figure out what was going on. Um, and, um, and, and then we uh, went in to request a, you know, for him to be released on a bond. Uh, and I submitted this boilerplate kind of report, um, which we, we were seeing a lot of um, in the immigration courts at that time, um, just saying that he's a verified gang member. Um, and then kind of like at the end, there are bullet points of the basis for the information that were kind of like hits in the, in the um, system that, were, that the ICE officer had redacted. So we, it was a little bit harder for us to find out what the underlying accusations were. Um, and then um, they also shared some pictures from Facebook. So the clothes he was wearing, um, wearing blue, anyone wearing blue, um, anyone wearing Chicago Bulls hat um, and the, the Air Nikes. That um, was the evidence against him. Um, there are also just some pictures, like I said, of you know, him making um, the, the peace sign. And, and one of the pictures, like a later, in a, a later hearing um, they were using as evidence was actually wearing his like school jacket, which was blue and white. Um, and they were trying to, to use that as evidence of gang membership. Um, so, you know, he, this is someone who was on his kind of pathway to get his residency um, based on, you know, things that had happened to him. Um, the judge denies bond, um, you know, holds him no bond. Um, and then when the residency application comes up, that's denied as well as a matter of discretion because the judge found that he was um, gang affiliated. So, so that kind of like shows you like a little bit about how it all works. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about some of the public discourse in the immigration setting. Um, there have been kind of like anti-gang efforts in the Department of Homeland Security and ICE since the 1990s operations where they're trying to target folks that they've identified as, um, uh, as gang members. Um, but, you know, we really heard, we heard this, you know, during the, kind of Obama era, thinking about immigration enforcement priorities. Um, and when he said, you know, we have to focus on threats to our security, felons, not families, criminals, not children, gang members, not a mom working hard to provide for kids. So like relying, relying really heavily on this idea of like the good immigrants and the bad immigrants um, and people who are kind of entangled in any way in the criminal legal system are disposable. Um, and alongside that, actual immigration priorities, uh, memorandum um, and ICE um, saying to kind of target people um, who have gang affiliation. And so that, that was the backdrop actually in, in which, you know, my client and, and many other people were starting to be arrested. It was during that time. Um, although we saw a doubling down of it during the kind of Trump administration, um, Trump said that MS-13 gang members were exploiting loopholes in our laws to enter the country as unaccompanied um, minors. They look so innocent, they're not innocent, right? Former um, Attorney General Sessions um, said, you know, we're working with the Department of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services to examine the unaccompanied minor issue and the exploitation of the program by gang members who come to this country as wolves in sheep's clothing. So, you know, very loaded language, um, really trying to kind of amplify these uh, racist narratives and um, targeting kind of like brown and, and black children um, as gang members and, and therefore um, priorities for, for deportation. 
Um, okay, so that's the, uh, maybe I'll just pause one minute. So that was kind of the backdrop of um, Rachel and I kind of hearing a lot from folks that they were seeing this come up more and more in court uh, and seeing more and more of like reports like this and other things. And so we did a survey starting in 2017 into 2018 and then wrote this report. Um, and we heard, you know, we primarily sent it out along kind of like nonprofit immigration um, attorney listservs um, and had, a, you know, a little over 70 people from across the country complete it. And, um, you know, by and large, they, their observations were that gang allegations seemed to be um, on the rise at that time. They were seeing them more frequently. Um, and um, so, you know, we asked them a, few, a number of questions, just like try to understand what folks were seeing. Um, at, you know, how were these, how was information coming into, you know, immigration courts, into asylum offices, um, into um, you know, citizen and immigration services offices and their interviews. Uh, and it was coming through a, a lot of different ways. Sometimes there were police reports being submitted. Sometimes it was the I-213, which is like the immigration kind of police report when someone's encountered. Um, a lot of time people were being shown pictures of social media. So just kind of uh, officers um, doing their own uh, immigration, um, sorry, uh, kind of surveillance, taking um, pictures down, trying to find pictures. Um, sometimes evidence of a tattoo, no matter what the tattoo was, um, was being used as evidence of, of gang affiliation. Um, certainly people mentioned databases. Sometimes it's hard to know how the information got there. So people might no, not know that it, it came from a database. I had to do a lot of public records requests um, in order to figure out how the information had kind of made its way. Um, so there's, there's kind of no, no real transparency um, that, you know, immigration courts or administrative courts are not like other courts where you have discovery. Um, and um, there's a lot of kind of op opaqueness and then a lot of discretion um, given to, to the judge. Sometimes someone's own testimony was being used against them um, because, you know, they, you know, uh, kind of, said that they were, um, oftentimes people had asylum claims related to kind of like gang violence in their home country um, or, or attempted kind of gang recruitment. And that was being used as a basis to say um, that they were affiliated with a gang or they helped a gang or, or if, if it was a family member who was a gang member, um, that was being used against them as well. So we, we were seeing kind of a wide variety of information um, coming, seeping into um, various immigration proceedings. Uh, and as I mentioned, it was really across the board, across different parts of the Department of Homeland Security um, and the Department of Justice. You know, we we're seeing it in immigration courts. We we're seeing it before USCIS. We we're seeing it um, as well in asylum offices. Uh, bond hearings were very frequently the ways people were seeing it come up, um, arguing that someone was a threat to the community because they were somehow gang affiliated and then judges denying bond. Uh, but also for all sorts of benefits for asylum. Um, it was people were being denied asylum because, you know, it's a discretionary benefit so they could meet all the other requirements. Um, but, you know, saying in one case, uh, we don't find the court said that they didn't find someone credible because of their gang involvement, um, which is again another um, it's kind of an often necessary to kind of prove your case, um, but also because these different things are discretionary, they're being de defined, uh, denied. DACA um, adjustment um, that refers to people trying to become legal permanent residents, green card holders, um, so all different types of applications. Um, and then we were seeing it, as I said, like coming up in terms of testimony. And so there would be questions like, you know, do you have a tattoo, um, you know, pictures of social media, who are these people, you know, sometimes pictures of people they didn't even know, like, do you know who these people are? And they'd be pictures of other people they, that, the, you know, ICE believed were gang members, who are these people? Um, and then questions about, you know, particularly for folks who um, had claims, asylum claims based on gang violence in their home country, you know, you know, what, what did you ever do for the gangs? Did you ever give them money if they were charging, you know, communities and neighbor folks in the neighborhood um, for kind of safety? Like, did you pay them? Were you then part of the gang? And so 
um, questions along those lines. Um, and so there, our report dove into like other parts of the kind of immigration system, but I was just kind of kind of say big picture, you know, the concerns folks have were, you know, concerns that folks here have voice that you're really criminalizing communities. Um, you're criminalizing just like regular teenage behavior. Um, also just the fact that you're, um, you know, black or Latinx and, and a boy of a certain age, there's gonna be almost a presumption against you. Uh, and then you have to prove a negative and there's no kind of definitions for, for really what you're proving anyway. Um, so, so these were some of the things that folks said to us. Gang allegations make it easier for the government to criminalize and deport people. Social media is being used to allege facts and then judges are just accepting it. Um, you know, that, that it's racist. Um, and so, um, you know, these are trends that we see in immigration court in all sorts of ways. It's not that it's so um, far afield from what normally happens in immigration court. It's often par for the course, um, but, uh, but very specifically gang allegations were being used in this way to disproportionately impact um, young people, um, immigrants um, of color, um, um, you know, just, just, just for being young people. Um, okay, so, uh, so I was going to just talk a little bit about, so that was the report, um, you can find it online if you're interested in it, and there are kind of more details about what people were seeing at that time in, in 2018. We also wrote a practice advisory for people who are practicing in immigration court with AILA. <clears throat> Happy to talk about that as well, um, kind of strategies people were using to, to challenge those like in the immigration court proceedings. Um, certainly at that time, there wasn't as much research being done about kind of gang based um, databases nationally, but we were relying heavily on audits done on Cal gangs and, and reports written about um, Cal gangs at that time. Um, okay, so fast forward to today. Um, and, you know, I will say that, you know, recent ICE enforcement priorities memo does also prioritize, you know, gang um, associations. Um, it, there are interim ICE priorities that were published in February and, and those who pose a threat to public safety, including those who may have participated in certain gang activities are a priority for deportation. So we're, we're seeing a continue, continuation of prioritization um, of gang affiliation um, in the immigration system. But I would say there, there is some good news. Um, so, you know, one, one piece of like recent ish news. Um, there was this litigation um, in California, a bunch of young people were kind of mass arrested and put in detention after having been released from the Office of Refugee and Resettlement. Um, they were taken and, and kind of on the basis of these uh, gang allegations. Within a month um, after the, the, the litigation, almost the vast majority were released. Um, and recently a settlement has come out of that and the settlement is final. Um, as a result, um, uh, USCIS, Citizen and Immigration Services, is not supposed to revoke someone's special immigrant juvenile status. So that's like a status, um, uh, it's a pathway to residency. They're not supposed to revoke it in whole or in part based on the, the, the immigration agency saying like gang affiliation wasn't being taken into account in, in, in the underlying um, findings, the predicate order findings. Um, so, th so that was a, a, an area where people were seeing a lot of denials related to gangs. Also, class members have the right to a hearing if they are rearrested after being released from ORR within a week um, for a bond. And then there are certain re um, rights related to other immigration applications, um, T visas for those who've you know, um, uh, been trafficked, U visas for those who have um, experienced certain crimes um, as well that are not supposed to be kind of um, uh, kind of denied in that same way. Uh, and then I think kind of bigger picture and like um, the bookends of, 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 of my presentation, like more like a brighter spot is just the kind of advocacy and organizing that's happening right now. And I just feel like there is a lot more public awareness um, of the widespread surveillance that's happening, um, of the interconnectedness um, of these different agencies and how 
racialized policing is being amplified and multiplied um, through these um, different networks. Um, and, and just having public awareness about that is really important. It obviously can achieve the kind of change that Chanada and Alex were talking about earlier. Um, but I also think it's important for kind of the mainstream immigrant rights groups and hopefully as there are pushes for different kind of legislative changes and reforms, people will, uh, I, I hope, um, kind of be meet more informed about um, giving up the rights of some parts of the community and um, will push back more um, when there are kind of, um, when, when folks who may have gang affiliations or um, alleged uh, membership or, you know, uh, all those communities will hopefully not be carved out of protections um, in the same way that they long have been. Um, so, so that's my hope and um, I'm really excited to, to hear more from um, Julie as well. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Um, so I was hoping maybe that we did see a little bit more uh, in the federal prosecu uh, immigration prosecutors, but um, I guess that's something. Uh, back to the Obama is not necessary. Obama area is not, back to the Obama era is not, you know, what we're trying to do. Um, but I will say just to connect the dots between those last two uh, presentations is that I have found that with electeds, when you show them the audit from the Chicago gang database or the audit of the Cal gang database, and that when you have independent audits of these things, they're just completely indefensible. And that there are hopefully people at the federal level who'll be receptive to, to hearing now that even if you wanna prioritize the deportation of gang members, you gotta at least get that part right, who are people who are gang involved. Um, you know, I've done about expert testimony on about a dozen cases now um, where they're all, you know, people have Mexican national soccer tattoos and they're accused of being Mexican mafia tattoos. Um, things that are just, just not, not right. I even had one guy who had a crown, right? A very, it was like, it was obviously, it was a Latin Kings gang tattoo. And um, they put down that it was a Mara Salvatrucha tattoo because even when they were right, they were wrong. Um, so, um, the next session I'll be hosting actually will also be talking particularly about how gang experts get it wrong. So I'm going to invite you all to that too. Uh, but yeah, without any more from me, we would like to hear next from Julie Mao. Uh, Julie is part of a very exciting, um, relatively new organization that I hope will be part of her presentation. Uh, she's with the Just Futures Law. Just Futures Law is a public interest law firm launched to meet the needs of the immigrants' rights movement. Just Futures works in partnership with immigrant and racial justice organizers and base building groups and engages in impact litigation, policy work, and works to build a political home for lawyers and legal workers. Uh, and the more I find out about it, the more I feel like it's a model for what we do at the Peace and Justice Law Center on, uh, on, the, on the West Coast. Uh, Julie is deputy director of Just Futures. She's represented immigrants in civil rights litigation against law enforcement abuse and labor exploitation, and has worked with hundreds of directly impacted community members to stop their deportations. Recently, she's been engaged in legal strategies, challenging, challenging migrant prosecutions, technology-based policing, and local police collusion with ICE. So thank you, Julie, for joining us, and I'll let you take it over from here. Thank you, Sean. Um, that's a lot of hype. Um, <laughs> um, and thank you so much for inviting me and to be in community with my fellow speakers. I feel like um, I have known many of you for years now, um, both in New Orleans and in Chicago. Um, and yeah, just like super privileged to be in space with you all. And when I heard, um, you know, saw the email outreach from Sean, I was kind of like, Oh, I think Shana and Alex can, you know, uh, do the legal side of my presentation <laughs> around gang databases and, and tech um, because just the, the level of knowledge and strategy that you guys have built in this multi-year um, campaign to dismantle the CPD gang database and invest in communities. It's just really beautiful um, to witness and support. Um, but so yeah, just super quickly, maybe I'll um, I don't have a, a slideshow and I am hoping I can get us done 
by 10 to 15 minutes. So there is enough time um, for you all to ask questions of me, but I think most importantly, the organizers in the room. Um, but I'll just type a little bit of a flow of what I'm hoping to talk about um, and maybe truncate um, some of it. Cause I think um, my prior pre presenters have, have really touched on a lot of it. Um, so when I uh, was speaking to Shana about, you know, what, um, uh, what to sort of emphasize and talk about, I think, um, you know, one of the things we discussed was actually, you know, how do we reach sort of strategy, you know, a defensive and affirmative strategy to attack the system because the consequences for individuals is just so devastating. You're talking about being first policed, um, then having an immigration consequence um, and, you know, potential permanent removal from the United States. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to sort of highlight the example of, of Wilmer Catalan Ramirez, um, whom, um, you know, was an OCAD member um, that Chanat had mentioned before, um, who, you know, at the time, um, this was, you know, the first couple of months of the Trump administration, uh, I remember getting a frantic call um, from OCAD being like, this crazy raid happened you know, there were about 10 agents who basically busted into this person's um, uh, house. Um, they didn't knock, um, they didn't have a criminal warrant. They were conducting one of these so-called Trump, uh, but like Layla was saying, um, Obama era created, you know, ICE raid with a big press release and, you know, hundreds of people arrested um, and they broke his shoulder um, during the arrest. And that was because at the time, um, Wilmer was recovering from a gunshot wound to the head um, and to the shoulder. Um, he, that left him partially paralyzed and he could not um, uh, you know, walk from his bed when the ICE agents asked him to get up and um, assume the arrest position. Um, and they you know, were heavily, heavily during the whole process when we were started asking questions, accusing him of being this huge um, gang threat. And, you know, at the time, um, because we are uh, a movement lawyering institution, we had um, worked uh, with a number of communities across the US around some of these gang labeling issues um, from an immigration background. Um, and so, you know, I don't think we were looking to sue. <laughs> um, you know, I think we were looking to get what we could and, and get him free from detention, um, especially uh, with all the health issues that he was suffering from. Um, but, you know, we started digging and, and like Layla was saying, doing public records requests, figuring out what were these gang allegations, and finally, you know, um, brought a lawsuit around Fourth and Fifth Amendment and Fourteenth Amendment issues that later um, was able to review, uh, reveal that, um, you know, the gang labeling that happened um, was through one interaction as he was, um, you know, in front of his um, neighbor's house, um, you know, playing um, with the, the kids are playing and the police stopped the whole family for loitering. And he was initially placed on that gang database for simply um, being in a high gang activity area. Um, the second time uh, was a police traffic stop, um, stopped in a high gang area as well. Um, and he was placed on um, the police database through a police report that instance, curiously labeled um, and designated as a, the, a different gang and actually the rival gang. Um, and so when we litigated and brought this case, um, you know, there were clear issues that we could even point to um, in our current lawsuit um, that showed sort of the, the racist stereotyping ways and really just how this gang sort of data, um, which is just a, a composition of police reports and street harassment and stop and frisk was really based on a lot of racial profiling and compounding of the police and uh, policing of black and um, Latinx communities. Um, you know, and, and these sort of um, stories of folks deeply harmed by um, gang labeling um, or gang accusations that end up in a database 
you know, continue today. Um, we have been um, working with some folks um, in DC where we also experience large amounts of gang related quote, ice raids, um, where folks, um, you know, DACA recipients, um, uh, uh, status was revoked um, and then arrested because um, some school resource officer claimed years ago um, that he admitted to him that, you know, as a high school kid, um, they were gang affiliated. Um, so I can chat in um, some of those uh, complaints and articles so you can kind of see, um, you know, some of the, the facts of how this happens. Um, and then, you know, in terms of how do gang allegations show up in policing and then how do they end up with ICE? Um, you know, I think that what folks have said definitely runs true with the groups and communities that we work with. It comes in the form of gang allegations and stop and frisk cards, um, police reports, um, school resource officer notes. Um, in New York City, I think, you know, before they had this iteration of the gang database, um, they used to have each sort of district used to have these like physical gang books um, and they would insert their notes into that um, sort of physical book that they had. Um, and it's important, so I'm gonna shift a little bit um, around thinking about sort of this next generation of, of what these databases are becoming. Um, it's important to understand um, that the gang database isn't something um, that is somehow um, like somehow special, right? Like um, I think when people think of database, people think like technology and there's like some sort of sophisticated way um, that these law enforcement agencies are somehow uploading the information, vetting the information, um, really, it's a uh, data platform that collects the street harassment, the police uh, misconduct, you know, the stop and frisk cards, um, the police reports um, that, you know, a police department creates and funnels it into a particular data system. And so just to illustrate what I'm saying is, you know, I think in California, um, you know, there is this thing called the Cal Gangs database. Like when I talk to Sean, I feel like, um, or ILRC um, and folks in California, there is, does feel like a database that you sign on to um, that, you know, you can search and list a person. In so many other places, um, the gang database isn't actually like an actual database. It is um, a way to query the larger criminal data system. Um, and so that's kind of how I think about it in Chicago, for example, where there's a data warehouse called Clear um, and the way that sort of the, the gang database is, is consolidated, you know somebody's on the gang list, is just querying that Clear database. Um, and so it's important to understand that because, you know, one of the things that we, um, sort of deal with constantly is, you know, how does a police interaction um, that's, you know, a itty bitty loitering drop charge end up leading to an immigrant's deportation, an ICE raid um, and a broken shoulder um, and somebody's detention and deportation. And a lot of that is really the data sharing and sort of the mass surveillance um, that starts with human surveillance that ends up being collected in some sort of criminal justice database and then shared with multiple local and federal law enforcement agencies. Um, so how does um, you know, local police at this point share this type of gang related data? Um, so I'm just gonna hopefully be able to type this in. Um, and ap apologies that uh, there's some formatting errors due to Zoom. Um, so some of the data sharing, you know, there's definitely the direct data sharing, right? Like the folks um, in Chicago, you know, a lot of the, the reports have been showing sort of how 
um, for example, you know, ICE calls um, CPD and is like, hey, is this person accused, um, an accused gang member um, in CPD's gang database? That's the type of direct sharing um, that can happen, that frequently happens. Um, and certainly happens in the GMV, DC, Maryland, Virginia area um, where I reside. The other way that it happens is through uploading this data and or sharing it with other state, federal and criminal justice data platforms. So I think folks have also talked about the Fusion Center. And so what happens is that there are these sort of platforms in each um, local or uh, state sort of law enforcement entity. Um, I feel like, you know, the LA Sheriff's Office is definitely a notorious one for like building some of these types of regional or participating in some of these regional um, database uh, sharing programs. But basically what's going on is that, um, you know, for example, if you look at the Intercept article, you can see like emails from DC police with the Maryland Fusion Center, where the Fusion Center is like, hey, can you like download that gang database list? Like make a list of all the individuals in your records that have gang allegations. Can you put it in a CSV file, uh, which is like an Excel, Excel spreadsheet compatible file and send it to me so I can upload it into uh, RISnet, uh, which is a, um, type of data platform that fusion centers use to then share that data to hundreds, if not thousands of agencies, including immigration and customs enforcement. Um, and so that's in large part, a lot of the way um, that these gang databases or the gang information is being shared. Um, and then the last category that I think is emerging, um, but we are definitely disturbed by it, is um, the beginnings of private company um, data buying and data selling of criminal records data. Um, I, you know, GangNet <laughs> um, is a company, right, that sells, like the, the corporatization of the criminal justice system um, has been something that's been happening for decades, including in the building of gang databases. The, the one in, in DC is actually, um, with the platform was built, I think, originally I believe, by Microsoft. Um, you know, the, the corporatization of these systems um, has been growing for a while, um, but I think the last couple of years, it's just like because of technology ramped up tremendously. And so we are tracking companies like Apris, um, which is based out of Kentucky, um, which is basically buying and selling this criminal justice data, um, you know by the millions and you know, hundreds of millions of individuals. And at this point, companies like that can literally, are, are able to literally track people in real time, um, whether they're like in jail and when they'll be released and just incredibly invasive and personal information, including you know, what police have said about them and, and whatever allegations around gang affiliation. Um, and so what are we seeing in terms of, you know, uh, this next generation of sort of police public safety threat list creation? And we kind of really think of the gang um, database as, you know, something that could be turned in the future. Like I think Alex was talking about, like, we want to make sure we don't have, we, we do our organizing in a way that stops the criminalization um, and doesn't move it and have it transform um, into something else. And, you know, I think our concerns is that um, as we fight against and sort of disavow and discredit the gang database, the police will shift to other types of labeling. So instead of gang list, it'll be, for example, in Chicago, you know, the strategic subject list. Um, and so there's all these companies now um, that you know, instead of the, the very vague gang criteria are creating other types of vague data criteria to justify saying this person is a threat. Um, and so I'm just gonna put in here sort of a, a really good um, 
GitHub resource by Upturn, kind of talking about and, and naming um, what we call, um, you know, sort of the predictive policing, right? Like being in a gang is not illegal, as Alex said. Um, you know, these sort of lists are trying to say, this is a dangerous person based on this data. Have they done anything? No, <laughs> you know, and they are trying to sort of criminalize and, and ask the police, prosecutors, um, society to sort of pre, you know, criminalize individuals um, before they have taken any action. Um, and also, you know, these are not, you know, real community solutions. They are about, um, you know, suppress suppressing and using law enforcement activity against individuals. Um, so we're talking about, you know, secret um, data platforms um, such as PredPol, um, systems created by Palantir. Um, and I think, you know, the thing to understand about all these sort of databases or gang allegations is I like to um, at times quote Justice uh, Gorsuch and one of his 10th Circuit former opinions about like garbage in and garbage out. Like this is crap, <laughs> this data is crap. And now, um, you know, what they're trying to do is create databases and use, you know, sell like um, a data tech algorithm that washes that bias. Um, but really in the reality is what it spits out is still garbage. Um, and the last point I will say is that, um, you know, in terms of solutions and strategies, I really want to echo what um, the Erase the Database Coalition said about like just a really multifaceted um, strategy around both organizing and litigation that involves not just reports, not just litigation, like legislation um, at the local and um, uh, you know, county level. I think that as lawyers, sometimes, you know, we brought this litigation, we helped this one person get released from jail, get his um, immigration relief and get um, uh, a affirmative letter from CPD saying he was not gang affiliated. Um, but that didn't dismantle the entire system, right? Like, what does it take to take everybody off the gang database? Um, and so I, I definitely want to echo all the, um, you know, amazing organizing that's been happening um, in Chicago in trying to create such a multi-tactical way of dismantling um, the system. So I'll leave it there.